I just listened to your album uh, and we're talking on election day. So I feel like we're going to have to record a couple options depending on what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So I was just listening to your album. Um, and in the beginning, you, you mentioned Maddie. Was Maddie Smith your opener? Yeah. Uh, Maddie Smith, uh, Charles McBee was hosting and Maddie um, did a set uh, right before I went on as well. And so uh, they were both really funny. Yeah, I love Maddie. Uh, I interviewed her over the summer and we talked a lot about the process of uh, MTV Wild and Out, which I know you were on as well. I was really surprised how much is improvised and how intense it is. She said they record three episodes a day and you actually don't know the games or any of the setups till you're there. Can you tell me a bit about how you got on the show and what that experience was like for you? Yeah, absolutely. It is a pretty crazy environment because a lot of, yeah, it is mostly improvised. So um, you just kind of uh, find out a lot of things last minute. Sometimes uh, you'll know the night before what games you're going to play, but then sometimes they might switch it up right before taping and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I think um, the audition process is basically like, I think the first audition I like did a couple um uh impressions but then they also like threw like improv uh game things at me and like saw if i could come up with stuff in the moment and then the second one was kind of like a mock episode where i was like uh with all of these uh other people that got called back and we kind of just um did what we would do on the show um but a lot of the producers did literally say to me or, or at least there's like one particular one who was like yeah i really didn't think that you would like do well on the show and i kept That's telling so them to not hire you but um luckily um someone like there saw something on me i guess and like they gave me a shot and so uh it, it went pretty well i was able to do like nine seasons and um it was definitely a fun experience um, definitely met a lot of great people there so i still get to do sometimes shows with those people on uh Thing. I mean, not. I guess a lot of shows aren't happening at the moment, but we've done some wild and out tour shows live and stuff like that. So I'm still friendly with a lot of them um, through the comedy scene. But but yeah, I don't know. It was a good experience and uh, not sure what's going to happen next with it, but it was definitely a lot of fun. How did they find you? Because Maddie said they found her from roasts. Were you a big roast guy too? I've been doing a lot of improv in Chicago, which I think helped with wild and out, but I'd my main thing had been stand-up comedy. So I think um, uh, some things that helped were that I did America's Got Talent and um, I think they saw me there. And then uh, through some other shows, um, I think um, I think that's how they found me. It was kind of strange because uh, I didn't have any like agent or representation at the time. And after America's Got Talent, I was just kind of uh, <laughs> depressed. Like, I don't know if I'll ever get booked anywhere i think they just emailed me directly and reached out about um flying me to new york from chicago to do the audition and then the second one and um so i was i was definitely terrified uh i think i was like rap battling my roommates in our apartment just to like practice and things like that to get ready but uh but I really, yeah i felt underprepared but it ended up being a lot of fun I've been in New York about six years, but I guess I've been doing stand up a little over 13 years now. Wow. 13 years. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that that 10,000 hours to mastery thing is true that you can get good at anything that you do long enough? Or do you think some people have a natural proclivity to something like stand up versus acting versus writing? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think it definitely helps to work really hard at it there's a lot of people that are naturally funny that don't necessarily want to do comedy or do the parts of comedy that would make them get better at it um and you know the i don't know jokes part. I, yeah that's the worst part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so uh and then i mean there's also people that do comedy for years but aren't like writing new jokes or whatever so like i don't know they could be doing it a long time without actually getting better and then there's mm. people that are able to learn really quickly so yeah i don't know if it is like a specific amount of hours i mean it's definitely like i think if you like are really focused on like trying out new stuff and writing new jokes and trying to improve and trying to get better at performing um it can definitely pay off the more you do it but uh, yeah i don't know if there's like a specific 
length of time or anything. I mean, I certainly feel like I have a long way to go to figure things out. But back to the album. So you have a big chunk about a breakup and the grueling, depressive couple of months that is post breakup. And I was wondering how much of that is, is true. Sure. Yeah. It's all came from, yeah, I guess a real place of going through a very painful breakup. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think I was like probably in a really dark place when I wrote some of those. And now, um, luckily I got some material out of it. And that's like the one good thing about being a comedian is like when something, uh, really sad for you or really, uh, seemingly terrible happens like sometimes you can turn it into material in the long run but in the moment it's definitely not fun but uh yeah ends up being part of my act later there was one that i thought it just i related so hard yeah people say just avoid places where your ex go like that remind you of your ex and you're like well but i can't because we both met on earth so it's true when you're when you're grieving a relationship it's everything you're like Oh, the grocery store. He also ate food. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That's one great thing about comedy. Whatever, whatever happened, all your experiences come back to serve you. And I, I don't know another career where you can just like have that kind of catharsis. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe totally. a pastor. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, they throw it in their sermons. Maybe, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> they probably do. I would. <laughs> be like everyone's going to heaven except rebecca johnson <laughs> <laughs> have you watched the queen's gambit no i've heard great things and i actually played uh chess i think i was in the top two uh people on my chess team in high school it was a very small school a very small team but uh but i think there were only two people two on the team, team? <laughs> But uh, yeah, but uh, but it was I got I was actually really into chess in in high school and I stopped because I got I feel like I, it made me like overthink things too much like I got pretty good at it but then I felt like I couldn't really uh, just uh, uh, do things where like in life it's sometimes better to not overthink a lot of wait, things. Wait, that's so interesting. Tell me more about this. Like like you'd be three moves ahead. That's that's an asset though, right? Um, you would think so. I've had times where I think I tend to like overanalyze things, get so caught up with obsessing or analyzing what to do that it actually freezes me up from getting anything done. But at the time in high school, there was a phase where I was like, got really into it and was really competitive about it and had fun doing it, but also kind of over, overthought it, I think. Mm-hmm. 